Okay, I think we're going to get started again. So this is a practical hands-on session. So I see you've all got laptops at the ready. I'm sure you're not doing other work. You're just anxiously setting yourselves up to do these exercises. Uh, so Steve's leading this. Uh, Steve uh, works at Nurse uh, in the data analytics group. He's a deep learning expert, does things like running tutorials like this, and uh, also supporting PyTorch on our machines. And also um, he's in the MLPerf uh, well, he's co-chair of the MLPerf uh, HPC working group, uh, which deals with benchmarking on HPC Pipe machines. Uh, and then in research areas, he's also interested in graph neural networks, generative networks, and has done a huge amount on uh, applying deep learning to particle physics problems in particular. Um, so today, Steve's your guide to deep learning. <laughs> oh, uh, can, shouldn't this button do it? Yeah? Yeah. It has not been doing it. Oh, OK. Yeah, podium. That you oh. is that's exactly the opposite button. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you just said yes. <laughs> okay. How's everybody doing? <clears throat> Are you all lectured out yet? Ready to actually do some stuff? Your fingers are, I don't know, cramping up or something. The opposite. Um, they're stiff. I'll just shut up. Um, so now, now we're going to actually um, try to play with some of the the things that we've been talking about today. Um, particularly some of the stuff that Josh was just talking to you about. Uh, so what we have are um, basically the exact tutorials that there are the official TensorFlow ones, the TF 2.0 beta ones, the ones that he was pointing, uh, pointing you to on the website, looking through all these. Um, we've grabbed a number of those and basically just dropped them into a repository here for convenience with some minor updates so that they should work out of the box on Cori GPU. So changing it to basically load the right Python and then not install TensorFlow because we already have it installed and that kind of thing, okay? So um, basically what you're going to do, probably the easiest way to get to the stuff is to go to the agenda page, this one, right? So we're here on Monday, we're here, end of the day, building NNs using Keras. So if you click that, that should pull up the GitHub repo. You can also just find it by Googling probably, or you can go to github.com slash NERSC and probably just browse the repositories and find it. Might even be the top one right now. Um, kind of curious. Well, it's third, okay. Um, so what we have here are all these notebooks and uh, a little bit of instruction, some readme information to kind of guide you through it. It's gonna be fairly self-guided though. So, I mean, I have some suggestions on what you should do, that you should start with basic stuff. Some of you might be bored with the basic stuff. You can feel free to skip those and go right on to the advanced things. Um, I'll, I'll get into kind of get, making sure you get it set up on Cori GPU in just a second, but let me just give a quick overview here first. So, um, in the readme, as you scroll down, you see I have some contents here. So there's the setup stuff. Then there's introductory examples and advanced examples. So uh, particularly those of you who are new to deep learning, new to Keras, new to Keras and 2.0 even, you might want to um, uh, focus more on the introductory examples. And here there are several. So I've got basically by, by section in the readme is each, uh, is each notebook. And I have a link, internal link to the notebook. So, um, this will just use GitHub's rendering of the notebook that's directly in the repository. You can use that to kind of look through. Or you can click on the link that should go to the official TensorFlow page for that tutorial. So for example, we can click on the basic classification one. And you see these are um, basically the web pages that, that Josh was showing you. So this is uh, basically a rendered version of the notebook and you have the buttons that he showed so you can just click and run in Google Colab. So this is one option to you. You can run all these in Colab if you like, or if you're uh, feeling too lazy to fill out the form and get access to our training accounts, that's up to you. The, everything should run fine in Colab. Huh? They already got the accounts. Well, maybe not everybody, but okay. Or maybe you, got the, maybe you took the form and, no, no, you said we gave out almost all the accounts, right? Yeah, so presumably nearly all of you have done that. Um, but if you have some issues, you can always use Colab as a backup, okay? Um, for example, if your training account doesn't work or 
uh, if for some reason all the GPUs are gone. So we have 120 GPUs on the Cori GPU partition available for this, for us right now. Um, we might have more people than that trying to use them. So there might be a handful of people that just, there's no GPU available and you might have to use the lab, okay? Basically, if you have any issues running the stuff, raise your hand and, and somebody will, will come and help you. I'll get to who the TAs are in, in, uh, in a moment. But um, back to where we were here. Yep, so basically I have some stuff for all the notebooks. Um, I do recommend that you start with the, the basic ones, at least if that's applicable to you. So basic classification, I think we'll, we'll look at it a little bit together just to give you a sense before you're just thrown in the deep end. Um, and then there's convolutional neural networks. So uh, it's you know really the same level of, of being very introductory, but it will show you how to do, do CNNs. And Josh showed a little bit of that already as well. Um, just beyond those first two, you can kind of maybe pick and choose what you want to do next. Uh, Josh mentioned this classify structured data one a little bit. So this is basically if you have like tabular data, you, if you have data that's let's say in a pandas data frame where you have names for the columns and you want to build into your model some feature wise kinds of transformations like uh, he talked about bucketizing some features. Um, this basically shows you how to do all that. Overfitting and underfitting, so this is a lot of practical stuff. I, I do actually encourage you to, to look at this one because it's gonna show you kind of, oh, you have a model, it's very overfit, what do you do? Let's try add regularization and let's see, does it get better, how much better? And a couple different ways to do that. Um, and then the saving and restoring models, you might care about this for, um, you know, again, practical reasons. You wanna know how do I um, save my model and use it later? How do I actually use it to do science after I've trained it? So um, yeah, these are very much practical stuff. Uh, and then it gets pretty interesting now as you go down to the advanced notebooks. And um, here I think, depending on time that you have available, you can look into these according to your preference. So you don't only have tonight, first of all. Sorry, I'm going a bit out of order for telling you things, but um, we're gonna go through hands-on today. So this 3.30 to 5 p.m., right, end of the day. But tomorrow also notice we have this training uh, session here in the afternoon. So that's a chance for you to run on, to run things some more, to go back and try more notebooks or uh, try to tweak them more, customize them more, uh, things you didn't get to before. And then there's yet another one. So on Thursday, there's a self-guided hands-on here. It's part of this working lunch. So you might just wanna eat, that's perfectly fine, but you'll also have the opportunity to again, play with these notebooks there. And there will by then also be other things that you can play with. Um, we're, um, we may have like a hyperparameter optimization example you can run from, from then and some other stuff. So uh, yeah, so you don't have to get through it all today. You don't just have to like click every cell as fast as you can and try to get done. Um, I do encourage you to take your time and try to understand things, read through it. Uh, and yeah, so the advanced ones, there's a lot of fancy stuff. Uh, Josh pointed you to some of these a little bit. So like defining custom layers. How do I um, write my own Keras layer? Uh, this was a pretty nice one I, I looked through briefly. Um, and if you have any kind of fancy thing you might wanna do, you might have to write a custom layer. So this is gonna be useful for you. Um, there are some that focus a little bit on how you do this data pipeline, this processing, pre-processing of data kind of stuff. So built into TensorFlow 2.0. So loading and pre-processing images has um, a lot of different, um, uh, kind of examples for how you can use TF data to, to load your load your images, do some pre-processing and so on. Um, it, it, it covers some pitfalls of like what might be slow, what might be fast, and it does some timing so you can actually see, oh, this is fast, this is slow, to give you a sense of what you should do when you write your own TF data pipeline. So very practical, but um, also getting a little bit more technical. So if you don't care about that so much, if you don't care about uh, performance too much, you can probably skip that one. And you might be more interested in playing with things like generative models. So there's a DC GAN example, um, a variational autoencoder example. Uh, we, I did recently put in the cycle GAN example, um, basically because I saw Josh was, I think, going to talk about it. So um, these more advanced ones, um, there's only so much you can do in like an hour and a half on a single GPU, obviously. You'll be able to run these, and uh, they, they might take a while. You might want to decrease the epochs if it looks like it's going to take a long time. I already did decrease the epochs for some of them so that they would finish a little bit faster. But then you might not get the most really state-of-the-art results when you run them. So don't expect to get just like really amazing translation of forces to zebras. It's gonna look a little bit, it's gonna look a little bit messy. Or the uh, image captioning one, I did play with this once and saw a pretty kind of bizarre example. I won't, I won't show it to you, but 
it went a little crazy. Um, but yeah, so you can work through those. Uh, image captioning was one here, yeah. Um, I, there's also an example here if you want to try and get TensorBoard working in the, in the, the notebooks. Um, we, we did manage to get this to work. I'm not sure it's really production ready yet, so you might run into issues and you can let us know if you do. Okay, so um, I think what we'll do now is really kind of go back to making sure everybody can get set up and, uh, and start running these. So hopefully everybody filled out the form, got um, a training account. We actually don't have any more training accounts yet. So um, if you don't have a training account yet, I think you probably just have to use Colab at this point. There might still be a few. Does anybody still need a training account? Everybody's filled out the form, got a training account if they want one. Okay. I think the training accounts will last throughout this week and then they will be purged, reset at some point on the weekend or early next week. I think you could probably use the give command actually. Um, so if somebody's interested in, in doing that, we can just, uh, we can show you how to do it. But there's a give command. So you can give something to another user a nurse and it'll cache it in the scratch and then you get an email and you use take to get this stuff. So I think that's probably the easiest. So if, if anybody has a NERSC account wants to know how to do that, then just ask us and, and I'll show you. I, I expect it's probably the minority of people, but. Okay, so you have your account. Now you need to log in and try. I've actually seen that there are a number of training accounts already logged in on Cori GPU. So how many people have already started up Jupyter, kind of worked ahead in the instructions and they got a GPU node? Most of the people, okay, that's great. Um, but for the rest who haven't done it yet, who weren't as eager or who were, you know, paying close attention to the lectures, um, I'll, I'll just sort of briefly show you what to do. So first of all, um, no, okay, we'll start with Cori GPU and then, and then I can mention, mention Colab, but Colab's easier. You just click that button and you get a Colab runtime. Josh, Josh showed you how to do it. Um, on Cori GPU, you need to use this URL that Wahid mentioned earlier to get to Jupyter, to get to Jupyter Hub. So it's jupyter-dl.nurse.gov, okay? If you're already logged in and you try to come in again, you might see something like this. Um, I think what I'll do is, um, it's a little bit risky now to log out, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that and show you from scratch. Uh, of course, I don't have a training account, so I have to use actually an OTP. I don't know how secure it is to show you my OTP. I should be logged out now. Yeah, so I didn't kill. Oh, I logged out. <laughs> we'll remind you about that pitfall later. Don't just log out. Don't just close your browser. You do actually need to um, to kill your job manually. It's just like a minor kind of quirk of our setup that we hope to make better in the future. Um, so here you're going to put your training account name, train one two three, and you're going to put the password here. You're not gonna put anything for OTP. So even if there's like a third column, which is just the training account index, don't put that in there. Um, so you leave that one blank. I have to put something because I'm not using a training account. Okay, and then you're gonna get those buttons. We had showed this earlier, GPU node, CPU node. Um, I will stress again. So for training, we want you to use a GPU node. Um, so um, the nice thing is if you try to do a CPU node and you start to run the notebooks, I think you will get some error message right away because it'll try to use uh, CUDA libraries and this TensorFlow that has CUDA and I, I think it won't work. I, I could be wrong, but you definitely want a GPU node because it's faster and it's kind of the fancy stuff that we have. So, and, and that's what this is you know, for you to run is you won't be uh, hogging resources on a shared thing. Um, the GPU nodes, they are actually shared nodes, but you get just like a fixed subset of a node and you get one of the GPUs on that node, okay? That's a technical detail you don't really need to worry about. Um, but once you've started up your, once you've clicked that button to start up your server on that GPU node, you should land on a page that looks a little bit like this. It might look a little bit different because I have a bunch of these custom kernels. You might only see a few, okay? But then what you're gonna wanna do is clone the repository so you have all the notebooks there ready to go. Um, so the, the easiest way to do this is to start a terminal. And this is all in the instructions, by the way, getting started on Core GPU. So right here, we're on the second part, start a terminal uh, by scrolling to the bottom and finding the terminal button. So these are basically notebook kernels to run things like Python and a, and a Jupyter notebook. 
Um, there's also this console stuff, which is just like a, a Python console kind of thing, not in a notebook. And then other, down at the bottom, you can do things like open a text file or open a terminal. So this is what we want to do. We want to open a terminal, because we're going to use that to clone the repository with Git. Okay. So you should see a nice regular uh, Linux terminal, and now you can copy and paste this depending on your setup. If you have a Windows laptop or possibly a different browser, sometimes copy and paste doesn't work. Uh, apologies for that. That's very annoying for those who have to type it out. Um, but for those, you know, who are, um, you know, one of us folks with MacBooks and, you know, the vast majority of us do, and it's very easy, you should just be able to copy paste the git clone command. Okay. Um, now it should be in your home directory, and of course you won't have so much stuff here because this is my own account. Um, but now when we look at the file browser thing on the left, we see we have this DL for Sci TF tutorials. So that's the folder that we just checked out. We can double click that and open it. And now we see all the notebooks here. We also see the readme. This readme uh, corresponds to what we're looking at on the web page. So um, I, what you can either do is you can have the readme open here and just kind of browse through it and then click back to the, the notebooks that you want to run. Um, but what I actually think is probably best is you just keep this repository open in your browser as a tab. So then you can kind of work back and forth between <clears throat> the instructions here and kind of guiding you through which notebook you want to do next. And then um, between Jupyter where you're actually running the notebooks. Okay. So maybe it's a good point to sort of let you know who all the TAs are. And then I'll start to go a little more in detail through the first notebook. And then I'll just sort of let you uh, do your own thing for the rest of the time. Okay. Any questions, first of all, right now? It might be if you have the correct browser, you'll be able to do it. Which browser are you? Chrome. Did it work? No, it did not work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, luckily, it's not the worst possible thing that you have to type. <laughs> so. You might have to flip back and forth a couple times to get it, but you know, uh, where is it? Yeah, you just need to know it's GitHub, NERSC, and DL for Sci TF tutorials. Okay, might take you might take you a couple flip back to, uh, flips back and forth, but it, it should it should be doable hopefully. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Really fancy techniques now. Browsers in the same, yeah. Okay. Uh, however you want to do it, just uh, figure out how to type in that git command. And then after that, things should be easier for you. Okay. Okay. Um, so we're going to run notebooks. You're going to kind of, you know, choose which ones you want to do. Hopefully, enough people are interested in the introductory ones that this is interesting. Um, I have things like little quiz questions after you run the notebooks, try and think about these questions and see if you understand, see if you can find the answer. They're not very complex, it's just some pretty basic things. Um, on a couple notebooks I have suggestions of challenges, so things to try and do now that you finish the notebook, to try and tweak things, um, like changing the, the network architectures, um, stuff like that. So I really only have those for the first three notebooks, but you can probably come up with your own ways to tweak things in the later examples. And as you have issues, as you run into things, or if you just have questions, you have questions about the machine learning code, the models, something doesn't work, whatever, um, what you can do is you can raise your hand and one of us will try to get to you. So it's gonna be very hard for the folks who are in the middle. Um, just bear with us. Uh, we'll try to do our best to get you know to where you are. You might need to kind of meet us halfway or something like this. We'll play it by ear and try to do the best. This is not the best room for this kind of hands-on thing, but this was the best that we could get for the, the size, for the number of people we we're gonna have. So um, we have kind of an army of secret agents in here that are basically your TAs that are gonna be able to help you. Um, I'm gonna ask them all to stand up right now. So if you'd agreed to help people with technical or machine learning issues, please stand up. Uh, so this is the, these are all the people you saw the pictures of in Wahid's slide early today. He, and he made it sound like he needed to memorize those photos. So this is your chance now. You, you don't necessarily need to memorize those photos. Now you can see what they're actually wearing today and what their hairstyle is today. So these are the folks who will be uh, hopefully able to help you. If they can't help you, maybe they'll try to flag somebody else who can. 
hopefully we won't have any issues and everything will just run out of the box. And then you might just have interesting machine learning questions and we're happy to talk about those too. Okay? Any questions before we start going through the first notebook together? Does anybody want me to show you really quick how to start them up in CoLab? Or are you already were able to figure that out? Ah, yes, Slack. Yeah, we'll be monitoring the, the Slack at least as well as we can. So post questions there. And, um, and either we can try to get, or if there are other people in the room who feel keen and, and know the answer, um, feel free to help each other and save us the effort. Okay. So um, at this point, feel free to ignore me, especially if you already know the introductory stuff and you just want to kind of plow ahead and work through more advanced stuff. But um, for the benefit of those that this might benefit, I will just kind of briefly walk through the first basic classification example, at least to some level of detail that seems appropriate. Uh, yeah, so, so again, if you go through this, you see we want to do the first one. So basic classification, there's the name of the notebook. I probably could have renamed things so that they would show up in order in the file system here, but I didn't do that. It's alphabetical. So you do have to look through and find it. But in this case, it actually is the first one because it starts with B. Um, okay, so basically, you should see that all of these are already using this, uh, this kernel, this installation up here that we have set up for the Cori GPU. Uh, so TensorFlow GPU 2.0 beta, okay? Um, if you do want to try another notebook that I didn't include in here, that's one thing you'll have to change. So I didn't put every advanced example in this repository. I just grabbed some that I thought people might be interested in trying. Uh, but if you want to try another one, like one of the ones Josh mentioned that I don't have in here, um, you can always download it from, from TensorFlow webpage like this, download notebook, okay? And then in Jupyter, you can upload a notebook. So you can upload it and it'll just appear right there along with all the other notebooks. Um, but when you run it, it's not gonna be using the GPU enabled software out of the box. In fact, it's gonna to default to one of our standard Python 3 kernels, okay? Um, so what, what, you, what you can do then is just sort of click up here and change the kernel to, again, you won't have this many in your list, but find the G, TensorFlow GPU 2.0 kind of one, okay? So just something to think about if that's something you wanna try. Of course, if you have issues, we can, we can fix them as they come up, okay? But really these should all just run out of the box. Okay, so we had changed the kernel. Then the only other thing that we changed was we removed the, the pip install commands. Okay, oh, I guess I did also add this thing. So, um, <clears throat> well, he mentioned this, that you might want to kill old notebooks when you're trying new, new ones, because you don't want like a whole bunch of notebooks all trying to use the same GPU, consuming its memory. Um, but actually, we've, we've at least got it so you can run like all the basic ones without any issue. You wouldn't necessarily need to shut down the previous ones. Um, and that, that's, uh, basically because we added this option here, this allow growth. It just means, so by default, when you, when you set up TensorFlow, you import and start talking to the GPU, it'll just snatch up all the memory by the default, so it has it available. Um, but with an option like this, you can say only use as much memory as you need and then expand that as you need it. So closing a tab will not close a notebook process, okay? So there are a couple ways. Yeah, one is, one is over here, you see the little green dot next to a notebook. That means that that's a kernel that's running. There's a running kernel process. So you can right click it and you can click shut down. That's one way. Um, another easy way is you, if you go to this little side tab here that shows a person running, then you see all your notebooks that are running and you can just very quickly say shut down, shut down, shut down, shut down. Okay. You can shut down your terminal too. Okay, um, yeah, so, so this uh, environment variable setting thing here is again, just to say don't consume um, all the memory right away. Um, I put in also this GPU stat command just so this can serve as a reminder to see, oh, I had all these other running processes on the GPU. You, you, would, you would see them kind of appear here with your username. 
um, give you a little hint that maybe you want to go close previous running ones. <coughs> um, so then I think maybe we'll just fly through this and focus on kind of the, what we think are the important things. Um, sometimes the, yeah, the import can take a second, but it's usually pretty quick. Here we see, okay, good, we're running the correct version 2.0 beta. So this notebook's gonna talk a little bit about the data set. You may have heard of MNIST, which is this handwritten digit classification problem data set. It's this really canonical, very easy kind of data set for tutorial-like things. Um, and um, uh, basically this is a, a, just like a slightly more interesting version of that, depending on what your interest is. But it's basically a drop-in replacement for fashion, uh, for MNIST called Fashion MNIST. It's just called Fashion MNIST because it's so much like MNIST. It's the exact same size of data, pretty much the same. I think it's all grayscale, but instead of digits, it's pieces of clothing. So it's pictures of articles of clothing. And there are 10 of them, exactly like the handwritten digit problem, okay? But other than that, it's basically the same as MNIST. <coughs> um, so, um, uh, yeah, Josh talked a little bit about like the availability of, da availability of data sets through libraries like um, um, TensorFlow data sets. Uh, Keras also has Keras data sets. So that's what we'll use here to, to download Passion MNIST. The first time you run this cell, it will download a data set. It's not very large. It'll put it under the home directory of the, the training account. And then the next time you run the notebooks, it'll just always be there and won't download again. <coughs> okay, but the notebook talks a little bit about what's in the data set. Um, not super crucial to go through at this stage, but you can sort of see they have labels and each label corresponds to a kind of picture like a coat or an ankle boot. Um, and then there's a little bit of stuff here that's kind of looking at the data and then um, um, basically um, preparing these labels. So we can look at like the shape of the data. So in the training, the training image data set, we have um, 60,000 examples. So usually, usually data is structured this way. In, in machine learning and deep learning. Um, you have some large array that represents, you know, a, a, a whole data set or a subset of data set where the first dimension is the number of samples um, or the number of samples in a mini batch. And then you have the dimensions of the data itself. So this is an image with a single channel. So we have 28 by 28. So these are, that's the dimensions of the image, 28 pixels high, 28 pixels wide. <coughs> okay. We have the same number of training labels. Uh, that should make sense to you. We want a label for every one of the images. And right now, all these labels are um, integers. So zero through nine, okay? Um, so now we do some pre-processing here. Oh, first we actually look at a, we, we look at an image. There's a little bit of scaling of an image. Um, this is actually one of the quiz questions, but we might as well just ask it now. Does anybody know why we take this data, this, uh, these images arrays and divide them by 255? Huh? Yeah, it's just a normalizing. So um, basically pixels in an image can range from zero up to 255. And it's usually good practice, uh, very, very, very strongly recommended. To always normalize your data in some way. So um, it'll, it depends a little bit on the case, like what you really need to do. So here we're just normalizing them all. So every pixel is somewhere between zero and one, right? <clears throat> That's usually fine. Um, people will also say you need to maybe normalize things so it's um, mean of zero, uh, standard deviation of one, so between kind of roughly negative one and one. The important point is just kind of to get the overall scale of your data down to something that's kind of matching, um, kind of consistent, maybe around the scale of order of one, um, and maybe potentially matching kind of how you're gonna normalize the weights in the model. Um, you can think of this as just like, if, if your data is somehow like, let's say all, all numbers with like uh, millions, tens of millions, these kind of values. Um, the first thing your model has to do as you're optimizing it is kind of learn what that scale is and start like increasing weights very much to try and think, ah, oh, this is the important scale of inputs and I need to map it into something reasonable. So you can basically do away with that with uh, pre-processing your data. So very important to always do something like that. Uh, it'll make some plots. So this is now the normalized images, I believe. Um, and we're just seeing it with the labels. We can see what's what, so sneaker, sandal, et cetera. Um, then the notebook's gonna get into how you build the model. <clears throat> so you've already seen some code a little bit, thanks to Josh. Uh, you can kind of see what we're doing here. We're using this sequential model API that Josh talked about. He said this was the one that you should generally try first. It's the easiest, fewest lines of code. If you want to write something that's fairly straightforward, like just a simple image classifier, a uh, sequential model is probably the way to go. So here we're just using some dense layers, so fully connected layers, um, and a flatten here, which just basically, uh, is that a quiz question? 
Should I tell you what it is? <laughs> I didn't tell you what it is. Um, yeah, so basically we want, we want these dense layers to sort of look at um, every pixel of the, the input. So we just flatten it into an array. We don't really need like the spatial structure for a fully connected network. That's what's going on here. So we're flattening it and we're running it through two fully connected layers or dense layers is what they're called in Keras. Um, as Josh said, there's often like multiple terms for the same thing just to make deep learning more fun. So fully connected uh, is probably mostly what people say when they mean this kind of layer. And in Keras, it happens to be called a dense layer. <laughs> but it just means that every neuron at a layer is connected to every single one of the neurons on the previous layer. So fully connected, everything's connected to everything. Uh, in contrast to a convolutional neural network where we have local connections because we're applying this filter at different regions. Okay. Uh, so we go through um, defining the model and calling this compile step. Josh showed some of that earlier. And then we just call fit. So really just a few lines that actually define the model and do the training. Um, I mean, this is mainly why we chose to do Keras for this kind of hands-on because it is the easiest to teach. It's the least amount of code by far to do anything. Um, PyTorch is nice though too, if you like, if you like, uh, if you like PyTorch. I, I personally do like PyTorch, but um, Keras is, is the easiest to teach. Uh, so this should train very quickly because it's a small problem. It's a small model. You don't even really need a GPU for this. If you run on Cola without a GPU, it might take like six or five seconds instead of three or four. Um, it's not a huge speed up. Um, anybody have a guess as to why? Because in a lot of cases, you might get orders of magnitude speed up on a GPU compared to a CPU. So that is why it's faster at all, yeah. But it's only like maybe 20% faster in this case. And data transfer is part of it. That's, that's usually like a major culprit is the data ingestion into a GPU. Um, in this case, yeah, that might be a bit of it. I, I didn't profile exactly, but that's a potential contributor. But also it's just a small model, small data set. It doesn't parallelize very well. So even if you had all the data sort of ginned onto the GPU, you probably wouldn't have really great utilization. So you wouldn't necessarily get um, amazing speed ups. So if you have really big models, like really big convolutional models, like you're running the latest ResNet on some large image data set, you should see really great GPU utilization. There's no real reason why you can't get it to um, be very high utilization, and hence you see really large speed ups on GPUs. Yeah, so you have access to a lot of very advanced features, and um, if you're interested in that, I think a bit of that is covered in the, let's say, loading images one. Um, I mean, also there's the, um, the data pre-processing. -pre so um, you'll see a little bit of how to use um, TF data in a couple of these. So there's the, uh, let's go on this way. Oh, I didn't have it up here. It's already in the advanced ones. Loading and pre-processing images is one. Um, this will have sort of mo the most advanced stuff, but it probably doesn't have everything. So um, there is actually a TensorFlow guide to using data, to using the data set, the data API. I do encourage you to, to look through that and look at examples that are optimized and sort of see how they put it together. But yes, there are options to kind of read things in parallel, to do some prefetching and to put them on the GPU so that they're ready to go as soon as you're ready to start processing that image. Yeah, there's quite a bit of complicated stuff. Um, even with Keras, you can do, just like with the regular Keras way to um, um, specify a data pipeline, you can have like a Python generator kind of function or a Keras sequence thing that you subclass, um, which allow you to do some parallelization and kind of, you know, um, prefetching in some sense. Utilization? Yeah, so you can run something like NVIDIA SMI or GPU stat. So I had that GPU stat thing kind of in the notebook, or was it? Um, but if you pull up a terminal, that won't be available on your path right out of the box, but uh, NVIDIA SMI is. So I should still have a terminal up here. Um, I don't think I'm running any, anything at the moment. They probably finished training by now, but you can run this NVIDIA-SMI command, and this will show you some details about the, the GPU. So here, um, this, this is the GPU. I have a Tesla V100, so a Volta. It tells you a little bit about the, the, um, the temperature and the power. 
um, and the amount of memory that's being consumed. So that's what you see right here. So we're using about half a gigabyte out of 16 gigabytes. And this percentage number here, this is your utilization. So if you're training um, a really heavy model, you'd hopefully see that around like 98 to 100%, okay? Um, at the moment it's zero because nothing's running on the GPU, but I am still consuming memory because there's still a process there. Okay, so this is a very useful command to know, NVIDIA SMI. Uh, GPU stat is just something that makes it look a little bit nicer. So um, what can you do? You can, um, if you really, if you wanna see that, you can do, you can load the Python module that's being used in the notebook. Um, I don't really have detailed instructions for this, but um, if, if you want me to show it to you, I can. You can do module load, that thing, and I have GPU stat installed there. And now you get just like kind of a prettier version of that. It's a little more concise, a little bit easier to read, and it has nice colors. So here I can see actually, oh, S Feral is the one running a process. And then if you have multiple ones, you see additional columns there. So a couple of ways at least. Yeah, okay, okay. So there are ways to say run the whole notebook at once in some of these drop downs here. So under run, you can say things like run all cells, run all above this cell, et cetera. You can go to kernel, you can say restart and run all cells, okay? Um, if you just want to work through them though, you can do shift enter. So um, yeah, sorry, this, we didn't give you a great overview of how to use Jupyter Notebooks if you want, but um, this is what I was doing. So if I, I like to run cells one at a time and kind of understand what's going on. So I would uh, select a cell and hold shift to and push return and then that executes the cell, okay? Or you can click the play button up here. Um, that'll run just this cell that's selected, boom. Okay. Uh, so let's see what else was in here that might be interesting. So we trained a model, we run fit, um, ignore the warnings. Um, and we got a result. So we saw our training loss, hopefully it's going down. Does it, so after the end of the first epoch, it was one and it, it came down to about 0.4. So that's good, we had some improvement. Uh, and then we evaluate on the on a test data set and we see accuracy we get, it's, you know, 88%-ish, not too bad. You might be able to do better if you tweak the model. Um, and then, did I run these yet, actually? I don't know that I did. Um, so model.predict, this is something I think Josh mentioned, but I don't know if he showed you too much in detail. This is just like you wanna run inference. You have your model is trained, and now you have some, some data, you just wanna produce its outputs, make its predictions, and then do whatever with them. You wanna do science or, or yeah. Oh yeah, there was some conversion of the integers to these one hot um, classes. Yeah, yeah, so let's. Um, not precisely, basically there's a mapping up here and I think I skipped it, where was it? There might, it might call a utility function, but. Ah, uh, yeah, oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, so there, there are a couple of ways. So you, I guess in this case, you can leave the, the labels as, as integers. Um, and then by using the sparse cross entropy loss function, it knows kind of how to implicitly convert those into um, basically um, um, class vectors. So, you know, the standard way is you have, let's say 10 classes, right? And for each one of those, you convert those into so for every image, you convert, instead of one integer, you have a vector of 10 numbers, right? And you have a one at the, um, let's say, index that corresponds to that class and a zero for all the others. So that's a one hot representation of the class labels. Um, so frequently what you might do is you use some um, utility function that can just convert integers into this representation, or you can do it by hand. It's not terribly difficult. Um, and, and then in your model, um, I mean, you just have a deterministic way that you're saying, you know, integer two, label two means that like, let's say the second, um, the second element of that vector means that it's class, that class, right? Um, and then in our model, we, um, 
we just have an we just have a layer which has a soft max activation, um, and so then it should basically all just work at that point. But uh, yeah, thank you. That this was actually something I didn't catch before. That that's what this sparse categorical cross entropy does. So it lets you pass in actually the target to these these labels, right? That was yeah. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, because if you didn't have sparse, if you just use like the categorical cross entropy, then I think your target values have to actually be this one hot encoding representation of the, the labels. Okay, so I think that's about that's about it. The only other things that this will do is it will look at some specific examples. So we we got all the predictions for our test set, which is now this this big array. So you can print out some values. Um, you can print out the what the overall shape of this is, predictions.shape. So, you know, we have 10,000 examples in the training set, and for each one of these, we have 10 values output. So this is that class vector. Um, and then what it does is it shows you for the first image what that looks like, and you can even kind of see that these are all very, very small numbers close to zero, except one of them is more like a third. So that's this one, and, and this one is about 50%. So you can kind of see it thinks, you know, maybe this picture is in one of those classes. Uh, and it just sort of compares, so the, the largest one in this case happened to be the, um, um, the ninth dimension or the, the, not, the class number nine, and that actually corresponds to the label, so this one was classified correctly, and then it does some plots that you can just sort of play with. Uh, this will show you sort of, yeah, for maybe this is that same one, zero, this is the same one, yeah, so we saw like there were a few classes where it had fairly non-zero um, results, and here you can kind of, you can kind of see it there. Okay. So um, that's about it. So you can kind of work through this one on your own and um, think about the, the questions that I had there. Right, where was it? Right here. So we already talked about number one. So you can think about these, the activation functions, and you can try to see if you can modify the architecture, uh, see what kinds of things you can try, um, see what works, uh, changing the optimizer algorithm, um, see if you can get, see if you can improve on the test set accuracy. Um, that's just kind of for fun. Maybe you can play with it and see um, how good of an accuracy you can get. And I do encourage you to go on to the convolutional one. It's a bit redundant because it's like very much the same kind of thing. I think it might actually be regular MNIST, not fashion MNIST. Um, but otherwise, it's very similar to the example we had here, but it uses convolutional neural networks. So you can actually get practice with um, instantiating those kinds of models. And then, then you can go back and figure out how do you customize that? How can I add in additional convolutional layers? How can I change the filter size? Stuff like that. Okay, um, I think that's about it. I already mentioned kind of the interesting stuff in the classify structured data one uh, for sort of tabular data and overfitting and underfitting. Um, overfitting and underfitting, this one will show you like how to put in L2 regularization to a model that's very much overfitting, how to put in dropout, uh, things like that. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, so um, what I like to do is, um, because this is IPython, you can just sort of print out the documentation very easily right in here. So let's go up here. Let's say we want to find the arguments to, um, tab complete also is very nice. Uh, it's below here, where is it? Is that the layers, okay. Let's say I wanna find the arguments to that dense layer, what they mean. So uh, I can do keras.layers.dense. Um, already, if I just sort of um, shift tab, you're gonna see something pop up here. Um, oftentimes, this is all you need. So this is literally just the code documentation that's been rendered here like this. You can see what the arguments are, and then you can see the doc string, which should hopefully tell you what all the arguments actually mean. Very useful, and it doesn't actually clutter up your, your notebook at all, okay? Um, IPython also lets you do things like, um, um, well, sorry, Python lets you do some of these, but IPython lets you do some more. Um, things like just like putting a question mark at the end and then you can see the documentation right there as the output of the cell. You can put two question marks and it will show you the code source, the whole code source. So you may or may not want to look at that. Usually, hopefully, you don't need that. Um, if I get to that point, I usually just go to GitHub and find the code, but I guess very rarely I do just want to look at the source very quickly. And that's a way to do it. Okay. 
or uh, it's very easily, it's very easy just with Google to find the documentation for something in, in Keras or TF Keras. So um, I can say TF Keras dense, and I bet you the first thing is going to be the API docs. Unfortunately, it's not 2.0, because <laughs> 2.0 is still in beta. Um, but here I think actually the API is, is pretty much equivalent, pretty much the same for, some, for these like Keras layers. Um, if you're worried, you might want to make sure you're in a, um, uh, the 2.0 version of this. So I don't know if this will keep me on the same page. It doesn't. You could probably add 2.0 to the Google search. Um, and yeah, then you see, well, you should see the arguments down here. There you go, the arguments. So activation function, you can change the activation function and now you know how to find it. Okay, any other questions? So we have um, 40 minutes left for people to play with things. As I said, you can run more stuff tomorrow or even Thursday. Um, the reservation that these jobs are running in will end at six. Thanks for stop. Um, so the thing is, if you're leaving now, please use the call to join the server. Uh, but also, if you do want to run some of the, uh, if you do want to run something, I'm pretty sure it will run after the reservation. So if you want to add some people, then you can leave that up. You sure it doesn't get killed at the end of the reservation? Uh, maybe. We don't know. <laughs> They're allowed to get killed at six. I think it might get killed at six, but I think you could probably still try to get a I job after that. I, I think you should still be able to, to log in. You might, even, you might be able to start a server, but it wouldn't be in the reservation and you'd be part of like the normal queue. So you may or may not get one after 6 p.m. But I, I do think if you have a job that's running, I think it would get killed. Let me just show you one more time. I think Wahid showed it, but how to close, how to stop your server, okay? Because if I, so just like how if I just close this tab, oh, okay, eh, it doesn't matter. If I close this tab, it doesn't end that process. See, it's still down here running. <laughs> Similarly, if I just close this tab, it doesn't end my server. So I'm still, I'm still consuming resources on the reservation, um, but, if I go back to my server like this, <clears throat> and I go to hub, so think hub because I'm trying to control this at the level of the, the hub, this is Jupyter hub, the service itself. If I click log out, that still will not kill my process. That only, <laughs> that only logs you out of the service, but your thing can still run and you can log back in and you can check the status of the notebooks. That's actually a useful feature, right? But if you really want to kill that server because you want to free that up for somebody else to use it, in case we're running out of GPUs or something, you go to control panel. You want to be back to this page with the buttons. And then the big red button is stop. If what? Yeah, it won't log you out, but. Um, yeah. Okay, if, if you forget to close your server, it will get killed on its own. So don't, you know, lose any sleep over it. So we're here to help. <laughs>